solve Chicago's pension crisis. Illinois has not had a gas tax increase since 1990. The mayor also wants a hike in the state gas tax to fund transportation infrastructure. The area's transit heads are here with reaction and an update on the status of the region's public transportation. A look at the future of road safety, especially with autonomous cars on the way. A surviving member of the Little Rock Nine on teaching students to promote equality in their communities. The heart of our bill is a tremendous amount of relief for the middle class. And that was President Trump last December. As changes to the tax code finally take effect, we get some year-end tax tips. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Eddie Aruza. Chicago-based McDonald's is making a change to its hamburgers. Amanda Vinicky tells us how, along with more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. McDonald's is serving up a happy meal for activists who've been, act who've been agitating for the fast food giant to make that change. The company will phase out antibiotics from its beef products. Scientists believe an over-reliance on food production, on medicines that are also critical for human health, is contributing to drug-resistant bacteria. McDonald's will start evaluating antibiotic use immediately and will have targets in place by 2020's end. We have more on this story on our website. A clash over TIFFs will live another day. A showdown on tax increment financing had been expected. Instead, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and critics say they'll try to reach a compromise. With TIFFs, property tax dollars are used like subsidies to developers. Community organizers and some aldermen want to slow down Emanuel's plans to approve TIFFs for several major projects, such as the proposed Lincoln Yards development. In this proposed TIF, an estimated $800 million of public money will be directed towards infrastructure that supports a high-end development project. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had $800 million and the opportunity to help spend it in Chicago, I can think of at least a dozen worthy projects and needed areas of investment. Emmanuel and his backers say TIFFs are necessary if Chicago wants major projects that will eventually broaden the tax base as developers can't take on costs like building new roads and bridges. Cook County commissioners are considering making a U-turn on a parking tax. The county board this fall created a special tax for parking reservation phone apps like Spot Hero, ParkWiz, and Parking Panda. That 1.75% tax rate is set to take effect in January. Parking otherwise is taxed at 6%. County Board President Tony Preckwinkle and Commissioner Larry Sufferden say it's unfair and possibly illegal to have those different rates. So what we're suggesting is repeal it, get back to where ground zero. Let's then sit down and look at all of our parking apps and all of the taxes and see if we can figure out a fair way to do this and not just give one app or one type of app a benefit over others. We, we gave them a commercial advantage. That's not fair. Sufferton says Cook County will be out $800,000 unless the change is made, but critics say the plan creates a brand new tax in that parking reservation apps deserve a lower rate as they don't actually own spots. A vote's planned for tomorrow. Teachers at the Old Town School of Folk Music saying solidarity forever in the key of A upon announcing they're organizing a union. One longtime teacher said it's about more than wages and benefits. He says teachers are concerned about mission drift, a lack of marketing, higher class prices, and lower enrollment. After a faculty backlash, administrators recently put on hold plans to sell the school's longtime building on Armitage. Organizers are asking management to voluntarily recognize their union. If not, they plan an election in coming weeks. As for the weather, increasing cloudiness tonight with a low around 29 degrees. Then tomorrow, a wintry mix of drizzle, snow, and freezing drizzle in the morning. Then some light rain during the day with a high of 36. Don't forget, of course, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and on our website. That's WTTW.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And now, Eddie, back to you. Thanks, Amanda.
As Mayor Rahm Emanuel prepares to leave office, he's making a proposal that's likely to generate controversy just as the race for his successor heats up. Tomorrow, the mayor will make a speech calling on Illinois lawmakers to change the state constitution in order to address the massive deficits in the city's public pensions. Word of Emanuel's proposal comes as candidates wanting to replace him face off in their first forum set to begin in just a few minutes. And that's taking place at the Copernicus Center on the city's northwest side, where Paris Schutz is live with the latest. And Paris, tell us a bit more about what the mayor is proposing. Well, Eddie, the political shackles are now off Mayor Emanuel since he will not be seeking re-election, so he can kind of say what he really feels on all this. And on pensions, he feels like when he's long gone, the city will not be able to afford to pay its pensions unless there are big changes to the Illinois Constitution. So, as you recall, the city is going to need to find about a billion dollars more per year starting in 2021 to pay into its pension funds, and that's on top of the millions upon millions it's put in through higher property taxes and water and sewer fees. And he says there needs to be sacrifice now on the part of workers and a way to reduce yearly retirement raises. So since 1970, the raises have been set at about 3% compounded every single year. Emanuel says that makes no sense. The city can't afford it. And in statements he's going to give tomorrow before city council, he will say, quote, the fact is a 3% compounded COLA in an era of low inflation is not progressive and not sustainable. It made sense in 1970 when we had more workers than retirees and high inflation, but it doesn't make sense today. In fact, over the next 40 years, the city will contribute $42 billion to our pension funds just to cover the cost of that 3% annual cost of living adjustment or COLA. That works out to more than a billion dollars per year. And as we've documented over the years, efforts at state and city pension reform have gotten struck down by the state Supreme Court because they enforce a pension protection clause in the Constitution. And that reads, quote, pensions shall be enforceable contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. So lawmakers have over the years voted to increase benefits, but any time they voted to rein them in, those proposals have been squashed by the state constitution because of the protection clause in the constitution. So to change the state's constitution, the House and the Senate will need to pass an amendment by a three-fifths majority, and then that will have to go to the voters on the next election ballot, and they'll have to pass it with a simple majority. No easy task. And in addition to this, tomorrow the mayor will call for $10 billion borrowing scheme to dump money into those funds now, hoping that the rate on the borrowing will be lower than the rate to pay on that pension debt. And he will also call for new revenue from legalized pot and a Chicago casino, in addition to changing the state's constitution. Paris, changing the constitution is really not a new concept, but the mayor is saying that now. So are you getting any reaction to him coming out with that? Limited reaction, Eddie, but talking to a few lawmakers in Springfield, there is next to no appetite to do anything like this. Public employee unions donated a lot to Democrats, and they don't want to make some of their campaign donors unhappy by taking up a bill or a debate to do this right away. In a statement, Governor-elect Pritzker said, quote, as JB has said, pensions are a promise, and the state has has a responsibility to live up to that promise. As he will work with the General Assembly to propose a balanced budget that meets our pension obligations and puts the state on a more sustainable path forward. And as I mentioned, you are at the Copernicus Center where mayoral candidates are about to debate in just a, a few minutes. Uh, can you tell us about any reaction that they're giving and, and what's going on there tonight? Well, Eddie, this is uh, probably the largest mayoral candidate forum to date. All the big major candidates have been invited to this. It's put on by a group of Northwest Side Democratic Party organizations. And an interesting wrinkle, there's another forum going on right now at the UIC Pavilion. That forum is on housing policy. So it's supposed to be wrapping up right now. And then they have to really quick race from the south side all the way to the north side in the middle of rush hour to take part in this forum. So we caught up with some of the candidates earlier today about pensions and they offered everything from consolidating all of the pension funds to finding more revenue to put in those pension funds.
What we are looking at is a way in which we can generate progressive sources of revenue to fill the pension void. Looking at the city's economy holistically, identifying areas we can actually generate revenue is first and foremost. Then we have to look at restructuring how we pay into our pensions. That includes reamortizing our pension debt. Obviously, the preference is to create uh, consolidated fund at the state level and to get more state funding, but uh, uh, as a, a backup, another option is to consolidate our local funds. For years, was one, the casino, the airport, number two, legalized marijuana and taxing it. Now the other candidates are saying the same thing. But, you know, take care of those things there, but also manage the budget the right way. I am a bona fide business person. So a lot of talk of revenue, no support so far for changing the state's constitution. We'll hear more from the mayor tomorrow at city council when he delivers this address. And this candidate forum, it's going to cover education, crime, all sorts of topics. It gets underway at the bottom of the hour. And we are live here at the Copernicus Center on the northwest side. Eddie, back to you. Thank you, Paris. Up next, a look at the immediate and long-term future of the Chicago area's public transportation system. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd. ComEd presents The Power of a Shiny New Toy. By switching to LED holiday light strings this season, you could use up to 50% less energy compared to incandescent light strings. ComEd, powering lives. After seeing fares go up this year, riders of the CTA, Metra and Pace have been given a reprieve for 2019. The area's transit agencies all recently approved budgets that don't ask commuters for more money come January. But for the long term, the agencies say they need more funds and a lot of them to upgrade rapidly aging infrastructure. Mayor Rahm Emanuel joined their chorus today calling for a major statewide transportation bill. And while other states are passing us, and literally passing us on the road, we need to be investing in a fundamental strength here in our area, in our metro area, in our state. That is why we're calling on the lawmakers when they convene uh, starting in January and start to work on a number of issues that have not been addressed over the years, calling for an increase in the gas tax by 20 to 30 cents. Well, joining us tonight to share their outlook for what it will take to modernize and combat competition from rideshare alternatives are the heads of the area's transit agencies, and they are Leanne Redden, Executive Director of the Regional Transportation Authority. That's the financial and planning oversight body of the CTA, Metra, and PACE. Dorval Carter, Jr., President of the Chicago Transit Authority. James Darwinsky, CEO and Executive Director of the Metra Board of Directors. And Rocky Donahue, Interim Executive Director of PACE Bus Service. And we thank you all for being here. and. Uh, we're glad to get you all in one room for one evening. Leanne Redden, uh, give me your thoughts and reactions to what the mayor proposed today. We're excited to hear the proposal. Our transit system is one of the great assets that this state and this region has, and we really need to be making the right investments to maintain the infrastructure that we have. We have significant needs, $30 billion need, uh, and the reality is we need the money to actually support and sustain it so we can get people to the jobs that they, this region has and, and keep this economy running. Dorval Carter Jr., when you uh, approved the budget in October, you added a letter of urgency as an addendum to the budget, did you not? And can you tell us a little bit about what was in that letter of urgency? Well, I think that, as you've been hearing, we're facing a situation now that's not sustainable. Uh, and while we've been able to basically continue to balance our budget and to provide the services that the residents of the city of Chicago expect, uh, we're not going to be able to continue that forever. And one of the reasons why we're getting together as a group to make the message that we're putting out there now is to understand that we need to deal with this problem, we need to deal with it now, both on the capital side as well as on the operating side. So that was the gist of, of your letter? Correct. There. So as we're hearing, the, the mayor propose a 20 to 30 cent per gallon tax to go to transportation infrastructure. Right now, there doesn't seem to be an appetite in Springfield for any more tax hikes or, or in this state for any more tax hikes. Property taxes have gone up in this city. We've seen a lot of new taxes and fees uh, in, in recent years. Do you think that something like this has any legs at this point to bring funding to your uh, transit agencies? Well, I think that there is 
definitely a, 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 a appetite for addressing the problem. Uh, the question of how that problem gets addressed, I think, is up to the state legislature. But the reality is, uh, as the mayor indicated during his, during his conference call or during his conference event, that we are the only state in the Midwest that has yet to raise our, our motor fuel tax. We haven't raised it since 1990. 20 cents of that 30 cents is really just dealing with inflation from the time that the last time the, sales tax, the uh, gas tax was raised. And we have an opportunity now to address this problem and fix it not just for the short term, but for the long term going forward. James Orwinski, come January, the, the legislature in, in uh, Springfield will be dominated by Democrats, super majorities in both houses, and a new Democratic governor. What do you expect from them in terms of funding for your agency and your uh, fellow agencies? Well, for the whole region, what we expect is them to take a look at the value of the asset in the region. This is what the other cities are trying to build right now, and this is expensive. Historically, when we were built 30 years ago, they were supposed to be funding us, and they did fund the operating side through tax dollars, but the capital side was left way in the back, and that's where we sit right now. The infrastructure is just aged to the point where if we don't start investing in the system, this asset, this region's asset, is going to start deteriorating. So what we expect them to do is listen to us, listen to the service boards, and then most importantly, listen to the 8.5 million people in the region. Are you optimistic that they're going to be listening to you? Absolutely. Let me ask you about when you ab approved your, your budget uh, in September, board member Don DeGraff is quoted with saying, we're going bankrupt. Is that true? He did say that. Is his comment true? I uh, had to walk a little bit with that comment and say there's obviously different forms of bankruptcy. I'm not a bankruptcy expert, but sometimes bankruptcy means restructuring. I think that's what Don meant. I, we're not at the point where everything's falling down and everything's going to close tomorrow and all the assets are being sold off. But it is to a point where right now, if we can't meet our operating needs, we're going to have to do some restructuring. Rocky Donahue, as I mentioned, uh, your agency also is not going to uh, raise uh, uh, fares next year, but you have made cuts. Can you tell me about that? Sure. We've, we've made cuts because it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Eddie. Um, our cuts aren't to balance the budget. We have, um, unfortunately, some poor, poor performing services, probably very similar to, to some of my colleagues sitting here. And what we've taken is about a million dollars of poor service and reinvested those in the, in the growth areas. Our, our bus on shoulder service, we're gonna be introducing new service that we're calling Pulse um, later this year. So it's really being responsible to the taxpayer. About how many, how much of your ridership is impacted by these cuts? Do you oh, have a number? Very little, very little, less, less than a thousand riders a day. Leon Redden, your, uh, the RTA strategic five-year plan calls for $750 million, but you believe that it should be 2 to $3 billion per year over the next 10 years at least. Is this all a lack of state and federal funding? The, the transit system on the capital side has been severely underfunded almost since its inception. Uh, and so what we're talking about is we have a plan, we have a strategic plan, and we have documented what the needs and issues are. We know that if we should be, we, we should be doubling down and actually investing two to three times what we have now to maintain the existing infrastructure we have and then start to think about some of the improvements and enhancements that we could make that the riding public and the economy really needs and, de and deserves. So, uh, Deval, Deval Carter, how much can you get by with at this point? Because you said that you have done some belt tightening. Um, is there any other consolidation that you can do at this point? Uh, will you need to raise uh, fares shortly, if not at, at, during this next budgetary period? Well, I think it's too early to talk about whether I need to raise fares again. I think we've done a really good job of investing the funds that we've been getting and, and really showing the taxpayers that we're spending their money wisely. Um, the fare increase that we just did last year, the first fare increase that we had done in almost a decade. And I think that as we continue to look for more efficiencies and ways to tighten our belt, we will do that. However, there is one thing that you're not gonna be able to do. You're not gonna solve this problem through efficiencies and cutting service. You're gonna solve this problem by providing a level of funding that ultimately will meet the needs for this region. I can tell you from my own experience that if you look around the country, there are systems in LA, Seattle, Houston, that are spending billions and billions of dollars to build the type of system that we currently have here. 
it's time for us to invest in what is our economic engine for this particular area. James Erwinski, you had a long, hot summer on Metro with uh, numerous uh, problems. There, were, there was overcrowding, there was air conditioning breaking down, there were a, a lot of delays. Uh, and you also had to implement a $400 million federally mandated safety system. How much did all of that further impact your woes? Well, absolutely. That was our number one um, woe this year. And it was mostly on our Burlington Northern Santa Fe line. That's where our positive train control, the $400 million safety overlay system, was actually um, rolled out for the first place. We had to shift schedules because of the system, because of the way the brakes had to be set up. And with that, it caused overcrowding on the trains when the new schedules came out. On top of that, at that time, we structurally didn't do well with the air conditioning. We have a lot of old air conditioning units that need to be replaced, some dating well back into the 1970s. We're running cars into the 1950s currently right now. And with those hot cars at that time of the year, pulling the car off the train makes that train shorter, which makes the overcrowding even worse. It took us several months to work through that. Let me ask you a question that has come up before, and that is in terms of there's three agencies here, and then there's the RTA, which is uh, uh, approaching 50 years, and the, the mission has somewhat changed over the years. But there, there's talk that there's not enough consolidation, collaboration. Why do you all need separate boards and, and, and separate management teams? Uh, Leanne, maybe you can address that first. Why can't there be some consolidation uh, of, uh, of the, all these transit agencies? We exist as a function of the state legislature. So the governance structure that we have by which we operate is dictated to us. So we collectively... is that something that you would push at the state level to say maybe we could operate better and more in a more financially viable way if we all got together? I think we talk about these things a lot. I think what we have very effectively done is shown that we can work together and work across agencies and partner on a lot of ideas and projects to actually advance the transit system across the region. So, I, you know, there's the governance conversation is a much broader conversation. Um, could there be some efficiencies perhaps? But I think we've all tightened our respective belts very well um, and are finding ways to partner and deliver better services across us and partnering with other entities around the region. PACE has a great example of partnering with the tollway. The tollway made some major capital investments and it's delivering their I-90 express bus and PACE is now just driving the buses on that service. So it's, we've been, I think, very effective regardless of how the governance structure um, is, is set up. You know, I think what we're trying to do we show that we can work together, deliver the services that we're supposed to, but what we really critically need is this stable, reliable drumbeat of capital monies that we can infuse back into the system to turn it around and really deliver sort of some of the visionary plans and ideas that I think we all Let have. Let me just get your quick take on that idea of, of consolidating, maybe even merging. What I do you that, think? I think that, that you, consolidating and merging isn't going to solve the structural problem that we're dealing with. I, I've been the structural in, problem the structural in terms funding problem funding. that we're dealing with, and you're not going to—it's not going to get resolved through a restructuring of all of us. I've been in this business for 30 years. I can remember a time when CTA, Metro, and Pace were at odds with each other. That doesn't exist today. CTA and Pace just recently in Evanston agreed to basically, in effect, swap out our services to make them operate more efficiently. Metro and CTA are in conversations all the time about ways in which we can coordinate and provide better service to our customers. The issue here isn't about how each one of us operates. The issue here is about the funding that we need to operate efficiently, and we don't have that. Uh, Rocky Donahue, let me ask you about ride sharing and, and whether that is cutting into your ridership and therefore some of your funding. What are you seeing? So it's a, a great question again. In, in ride sharing, um, the reality is it's going to be part of the transit landscape for many years to come. And we can't um, deny that they're not going to be there. Is it the demise of transit? Of course it's not the demise of transit. There's no way the ride shares are going to pick up the two million trips we collectively do every day. But there's also a reality of we have to partner with these ride share companies. And at least in our area with PACE, we believe there's some low-hanging fruit to, to do these uh, partnerships. One is we do a great job getting you close to where you need to go, but we just don't quite get you there. So maybe it's getting from the bus stop to your place of employment or from your house to the bus stop. They have first and last mile. In our more rural areas, Will County, Lake County, McHenry County, where traditional transit doesn't work, doesn't make sense, the density isn't there, 
ride shares are an opportunity. And in our system, service pretty much stops in the suburbs after seven o'clock at night and very little weekend service. There's a great opportunity for us to partner with the ride share there. James Sarwinski, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you are doing, positive or at least improvements that people might be seeing in 2019. I know that the A2 uh, uh, junction is, is undergoing a, an overhaul, is that correct? No, it's not undergoing an overhaul. Um, we'd love to do an overhaul on that. We need funding. Uh, A2 is uh, oh, So built. that's one that's a very much in need of an overhaul. Absolutely. A2 um, sits on a 1932 plant over a 100-year-old bridge. It's where seven metro lines come together. It's our Achilles. Um, we put a lot of money into that to maintain that system and make sure that that particular junction, which we call an interlocker, is fully operational, rain, shine, snow, and it's something that probably needs to be replaced. Ideally, we would look at actually grade separation where one railroad would physically go under the other railroad and come right back up. So are, do you have a lot of places that are, uh, are being held together by duct tape and band-aids to, to use it, uh, you know, that, that uh, analogy? Well, we're never going to run anything unsafe. So no, we definitely weld everything together. Um, we do have some spots where we, you know, certainly could use a little bit of a makeover on some things. A lot of the cars are really old, a lot of the stations are really old, but um, it, it's got a lot of needs. Torval Car Carter, very quickly, what are some of the projects that uh, you hope to accomplish uh, in the coming years with the funding that you have? Very quickly, please. Well, we've got the red line extension that we want to do to 130th Street. We have subsequent phases of RPM that still need to be done. Uh, I need to rebuild the blue line, uh, both the Forest Park branch and also continue the work we've done on O'Hara branch. And we need to implement our accessibility, our all access accessibility plan, ASAP, that's going to provide accessibility to all of our stations in our system. And we're going to have to leave it there. I wish we had more time to talk. And uh, But Leanne Redden, Dorval Carter, James Derwinski, and Rocky Donahue, thank you very much for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'd like your thoughts on Mayor Emanuel's proposal of a 20 to 30 cent a gallon increase on the state gas tax to fund Illinois' transportation infrastructure. So go to our website and answer our poll. There's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, one of the surviving members of the Little Rock Nine on helping today's teachers use lessons from the civil rights movement in their classrooms. And as many of the Trump administration's Tremendous changes to the tax code take effect, we get some tips from two tax experts. But first, for the last four years, our next guest has headed the National Safety Council, a nonprofit with a mission to reduce preventable deaths. Before that, she served for 10 years on the National Transportation Safety Board, including five years as its chair. But now Deborah Hurstman is moving on to Google's self-driving company, Waymo. And here to tell us about her new career move and reflect on her experience at the National Safety Council before she moves on to California is Deborah Hurstman. Deborah, welcome back. Nice to have you here. Nice to be with you. And congratulations on your new position and your, your career move. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that position and why you opted to make that uh, your, your next step in, the, in your career? Sure. Well, it's a little bit bittersweet because the National Safety Council's purpose and passion and people uh, are very close to my heart. But... This is the next generation of, I think, what will save lives on our roads. And it's really exciting uh, to think about what automation can do and the promise of the future. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being part of that. And uh, there's not many times in your life where you get to be involved in the start of something that hopefully will change the world. And what will your role be? I will be the chief safety officer at Waymo. And Waymo is really focused on building a safer driver. I know that you're, uh, you're limited on what you can tell us about uh, going to Google and this particular company, but obviously your experience at the NSC and, and, and previous to that uh, all factor into this. So what, what sort of things do you believe that you'll be contributing to the autonomous car industry, especially at Waymo? So I think everyone in the industry understands that safety has to be first and foremost as we start to think about what the future looks like. 
And for sure, uh, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. And so a lot of that happens in simulation and test tracks. But at some point, um, there's real world experience that needs to be gained. And you've got to figure out how to be able to do that safely and with confidence and to really educate the public about what autonomous vehicles mean. Well, let's talk a little bit about your experience, especially with motor vehicles and, and motor vehicle safety. Uh, one of the things that you worked on at the NSC was reducing motor vehicles de deaths, uh, but they have increased in recent years. I think they are now about uh, at about 40,000 per year in the United States. What can you tell us about your work and leadership at the NSC in trying to reduce that rate? Yeah, so we're really facing a, an important time in our nation's history. We had the biggest two-year jump in 50 years from 2014 to 2016. And as you mentioned, we've seen 40,000 fatalities for the last few years. Some of the things that we've worked on at the National Safety Council have been creating campaigns about educating people about the technology that's in their cars today called My Car Does What. We also formed a coalition with over 800 stakeholders uh, now uh, called the Road to Zero. And we published a report in April about what it will take for us to get to zero fatalities by 2050 in the United States. And what do you attribute that rise in motor vehicle deaths to? So I would say this landscape is very complex and we're looking at things like across the nation, we know what's killing us, but we're doing things that don't make sense. Like right here in Illinois, we don't have a mandatory helmet law. We know that vulnerable road users, like motorcyclists, bicyclists, pedestrians, that those fatalities have gone up. Um, we see states increasing speed limits right on Interstate 90 where I commute home. It's gone from 55 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour in the last year. Those decisions that we're making are pretty much counter to what we know with respect to what's killing us. We've got to make better decisions, but we've also got to invest in a better environment, a roadway environment, a safer design and also vehicles that can help improve safety. So you worked on a number of initiatives at the uh, National uh, Safety Council. Give us an idea of what you believe are some of your accomplishments there. You know, when we look at preventable deaths in the last four years, we've seen overdoses overtake motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. When I first came to the council in 2014, people weren't talking about opioids and opioid overdoses. But in the last four and a half years, this is something that's really at the forefront of the public's consciousness. I'm really proud of the work that we've done in this space, both to change laws, to educate the public, and to really reduce the number of pills in circulation. We've done it with a lot of partners, but it's an important issue and there's tremendous stigma attached to this. And so people are dying every day and we don't talk about it. You also um uh, address pedestrian fatalities as a quote growing epidemic and increased ride sharing is contributing to road safety issues. So uh, are those two uh, related? Yeah, so I'd say when it comes to pedestrians and vulnerable road users, we've actually seen this as one of the fastest growing areas of fatalities on the roadways. 10% year over year increases when it comes to pedestrian fatalities. Illinois is tracking the national data and Chicago is tracking the national data. It's exciting here in Chicago. Last year, they announced a Vision Zero plan, and that really does help when you talk about how to intervene and make changes to support vulnerable road users like pedestrians. All right, let's get back to your future career in autonomous vehicles, because this past March, an Uber self-driving vehicle killed a pedestrian in, in Arizona. Are self-driving cars really not ready for the roadway, or as they say, for prime time just yet? So at the National Safety Council, we've really focused on making sure that we understand both the benefits, but also the risks when it comes to different kinds of technology, whether it's the technology that are in, is in people's cars today, um, making sure that consumers know how to use it, or thinking about what the future looks like. We've weighed in with the federal government and also with states about how they need to be thinking about tests and vehicles in these environments. But the important thing for everyone to recognize that if we keep doing what we're doing today, we lose over 100 people on our roadways. That should be unacceptable to all of us. We've got to change the way that we do things and automation and technology holds the biggest promise to reduce those 40,000 fatalities on should the road. Companies like, like Google though, which have a lot of money, not be doing uh, road 
testing, but rather more off-road testing before sending cars out? It's important for all of the companies that are involved in vehicle design and testing to handle it appropriately. And that's where I think each company comes in is making sure that they have a good plan and that that's communicated and that p the public understands it. There's also about 50 companies right now around the world working on some aspect of autonomous vehicles. One of the criticisms has been that there's a lot of proprietary feelings about everybody's work, and rightfully so. But when it comes to safety and, and combining the knowledge that is, is, is uh, uh, gained from all of these different uh, tests, should there be some sort of coordinated effort to ensure the safety of autonomous vehicles? There's always opportunity for sharing best practices, for sharing data, for providing information to the public. And the government has actually asked those auto manufacturers and the technology companies to share their plans. Only four companies have done so, filed those voluntary plans with the government. Waymo is one of them. But there are 50 companies testing just in California alone. And so it's, it's really important to understand that having some structure and having some design will help all of us. And you've got to have public confidence. Deborah Hersman, all the best in your uh, new career out in California. And when you get back to Chicago, please come visit us and update us on Waymo. Thank you, Eddie. Good to have you here. Now to Brandis Friedman and a pioneer pro pioneering program for Chicago Public Schools. Brandis. Thanks, Eddie. It's a defining image of the civil rights movement. In 1957, nine young African Americans were escorted into Little Rock Central High School by federal troops. Their presence broke the color barrier at a previously whites only school. A new initiative aims to help Chicago Public Schools not only teach students about the Little Rock Nine, but use their story to inspire action. And the program is getting a boost from one of the pioneering group's members. So for Workstation 3, choices students made, how did individual students advance or impede the desegregation of Central High School? On a recent weekday morning in Chicago, a group of social science teachers has gathered for two days of professional development. It's part of a three-year partnership between CPS and the nonprofit Facing History and Ourselves, which works with teachers on issues of prejudice, racism, and anti-Semitism. What role did the media play in raising public awareness about what was happening in Little Rock? Their plan is to train all of Chicago's 8th, 9th, and 10th grade social science and history teachers on new curricula about Reconstruction, the Holocaust, and the Little Rock Nine. The lesson plans are designed to first help students examine their identities. To have them begin to explore what racism means and looks like in their lived world and after doing that after really um, going deep with the kids on those issues only then do we begin to go into the content and the history of what happened um, in little rock arkansas in 1957. then teachers help students think about changes they'd like to push for in their own communities teacher sophia logothetis says facing histories changed her classroom style and her way of thinking about the civil rights era I guess what's stuck in my head is the impact that one person can have on history and how um, I can bring that into my classroom and teach my students that you are one person, but you can also make a difference, just like the people in the past have made a difference as well. And as we mentioned, one of the Little Rock Nine is in Chicago this week, speaking with Chicago students and teachers about that history. Joining us now is Terrence Roberts. In addition to sharing his history integrating Little Rock Central High School, he also runs a management consulting firm specializing in diversity and human relationships. Dr. Roberts, welcome back to Chicago oh, tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. So what's it been like for you to speak with students about integrating Little Rock Central High School at the time? Well, I find one, they have a tremendous curiosity about what happened during that period. And it's actually a treat for me to be with them because I can tell the story and remind myself of what we went through. And I find that useful not only for them, but for me as well. So having lived this history, how can we improve the way we are teaching our children about it? Well, I think what Facing History is attempting to do is to bring truth to light. See, a lot of what kids are learning in schools about history is based on mythological constructs. They get versions of our story, that is our national story, that simply aren't accurate. 
And so by getting a clearer understanding of what has gone on, that better prepares them to be citizens of the present and of the future as well. Are there any particular examples of that incorrect history you believe they're being taught? Well, the one thing that comes to mind is something I encountered in fourth grade as a young student in Little Rock, and that was a manifest destiny story that we tell ourselves. It was the gist of that story that settlers from Europe were ordained by God to occupy this land from the Atlantic to the Pacific and to clear it out of any interlopers so that we would have full control. Now, obviously, that is mythological. Uh, the truth is something quite different from that. And if students know that truth, then that doesn't mean they will become anti-patriotic or anything like that. It simply means they'll be more solidly grounded in terms of the historical reality. Now, once the school was integrated, uh, describe, if you would, the day-to-day -day at Little Rock Central High School. What was it like for you and the other uh, eight uh, black students well, at the time? Well, I, I might say that we really didn't integrate the school. <laughs> we did a bit of desegregation, which lasted for one year, uh, after which time the school was closed. All high schools in Little Rock were closed. But what we did, I think, was to bring the issue to the fore. That confrontation in Little Rock spurred a lot of people into action. A lot of people decided, okay, we can't sit idly by and watch this happening over and over again. We've got to do something. So I think Little Rock was the beginning of plans, long-range plans, to really do something effective about teaching kids who they are, who they are in relation to others especially, and what could be done. Now, there are images seared into our history of the angry mob that met you all outside of school, um, those days when you uh, went to uh, desegregate it, as you say. Um, but there are also some bystanders who did nothing. What responsibility do they bear? Well, I think people who do nothing are really doing something. They are supporting the status quo. They are very, very loud in voicing that opinion, even in their silence. So I think they bear responsibility. They have the need to grow themselves, to learn, to understand. And I think if it were possible, I would put all of the, ups I mean, all of the people who are bystanders into a classroom where they could begin to learn something different. Do you see ways in which people are standing by today and failing to speak up or to do something in instances of oh, racism and discrimination? Absolutely, absolutely. Too many to count. When you think about it, this current situation we're in now, in terms of our national political scene, how else did we get here except people were being unwilling to look at the truth? You have said that we are still mangled in the mud of racist ideology. Yes. How, how so? Because, you know, as a country, we've never really confronted the issue of racism. We've played games with it. We have deflected. We have tried to get around it. We uh, believe in something that a lot of people call the progress narrative. That is, over time, we're moving steadily, but we're moving upward. I take issue with that. Just this past September, well, not this past, but 2017, it represented 60 years since the uprising in Little Rock, 2017. I put a guest editorial in the Arkansas Gazette, and I labeled it 60 years or one year 60 times. That's how I see things, that we've been spinning our wheels. We're doing the same thing over and over. We change the language. We change the players, we change the plots perhaps, but the, I mean, the thing itself stays unmoved, unfazed. In what arenas specifically, like with regards to education, housing, where do you, where do you see well, us? Well, we could take any of those arenas, but let's start with education. You know, if you listen to the rhetoric around education in this country, you would think that all of us are solidly behind doing everything we can to make sure every child gets an education. In practice, that's not done. Even though we still mouth those words, there is no action to back that up. And when you look at what we do in terms of providing the monies and allocating the resources, you begin to wonder if those words have meaning at all. What responsibility do you think whites have to discuss race and to have conversations about racism? Well, that's another thing. I have some issues about how we divide ourselves up into racial groups because race itself is mythological. We have to, we've got so much work to do in terms of extricate ourselves from this morass. Once we discover that every single individual in this universe is unique, and we happen to be different because every single person is different from every other person, there's no such thing as race. In fact, what accounts for the difference is not race, but ancestry. You know, millions of ancestors we all have come together, and then eventually there's us. Once we realize that and understand it, 
but we are so committed to the Balkanization that it's hard to even have a conversation about it. I talk to people today and I say that there's no such thing as race. I often get pushed out of the conversation because the stuff I'm speaking is labeled nonsense. I had a woman recently in one of my groups stand up and say, Terry Roberts, it's your fault. If you would just sit down and shut up and stop talking about this stuff, one day, she said, all the bigots will be dead. And I thought to myself, we are so far apart. Her understanding is so unlike mine. How can we have a conversation? But hopefully at some point, even with her, I could have a meaningful conversation because the one day the bigots are going to be dead theory makes no sense whatsoever. It's not about individuals. It's about systems and institutions and principles and practices that are rooted in our historical past. Well, and this is something that you spend your time doing professionally today is having the difficult conversations. What is your advice to people about how to, how to talk about these issues? Well, I think we first have to start with the individuals. Each person, each one of us has a responsibility to learn as much as we can about the truth of who we are and be willing to speak that truth loudly and often. If we relegate ourselves to simply repeating the same narratives that we've honed over the years, no progress can be possible, none whatsoever. Do you see any parallels between the experiences of the students that you meet with and that you talk to with your own experience when you were a student? In many ways, yes, because I see students who are shocked at the difference between the rhetoric and the reality. And they have to make a decision at that point. They're at this junction. And a lot of students, unfortunately, tend to drop out mentally, you know, psychologically. They're gone at an early age. I think it's imperative for us who have a different way of thinking about education, understand that it's necessary to prevent that from happening because all children need that opportunity to build whatever DNA potential they bring into this universe. Uh, what's important for students to know about your experience that, that civil rights curriculum might not capture? Well, I think for one thing, it's a lot harder than they might think. I've talked to a lot of students who say, I am glad I'm not living when you live because I don't know that I would have been able to handle it. What they're forgetting is the fight that they face is just as hard as the one I had. But sometimes they can't see the enemy. They don't know what's happening. They have no clue about what's going on behind the scenes in terms of allocation of resources, distribution of funds, opportunities that are lacking, et cetera. Now the door is open for some kids, but not for all. And it's important for kids to know this. Otherwise, they become blindsided when they get out there into the real world and have to support themselves. And they wind up feeling anxious, depressed, and, and eventually maybe even dropping out at that point. Terrence Roberts, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining wow, us again. Wow, my pleasure. Absolutely. And you can visit our website for more or of our interview from 2015, our interview with Terrence Roberts and the rest of the surviving members of the Little Rock Nine about their experiences. Now, Eddie, we go back to you. Thank you, Brandis. As the end of the year approaches, it's your time to get your tax affairs in order. Many of the changes uh, that were created by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed by Congress and signed by President Trump last December will now apply, including changes to the standard deduction. And with us tonight to share their insights and offer some tips on making smart tax moves are Jessica Spear, Private Wealth Services Principal at Accountants Grant Thornton LLP, which recently published its year-end tax tips. And Sean Siebold, President of Siebold Capital Management, which provides wealth management and financial planning services. Thank you both for being here tonight. So Jessica Spear, uh, tax time might become a little easier for some people this year because of this new tax bill. Who uh, does that apply to and how will it be easier? Sure, and actually I, I am not sure who is gonna actually see a better tax time this year because this tax act has made taxes tremendously more complicated than they were in the past. Really? It hasn't and, simplified it for anybody? Uh, not so much. There's a lot of complexity in the legislation. Um, and unfortunately, we still do not really know how tax reform is going to affect everyone yet for a couple of reasons. One, individuals have not yet filed their 2018 tax returns. And to put, you know, to make matters worse, the IRS is still issuing corrections, pronouncements, clarifications. So 
It's going to be some time before we really know the full effects. We're recommending that clients stay close to their advisors as they approach the 2018 tax season. Sean Siebold, some middle income families might, might find that they're hit a little bit harder because the personal exemption is gone. Explain the changes to the standard deduction. Well, the standard deduction has gone to 24000 for a family. So that has many different impacts for a family. It actually can help be helpful for some. Um, but what it can also do is it can actually change the way they think about some of the things that they were getting deductions for in the past. So as you're looking at this new tax bill, and I know that you, the two of you, I'm not sure if you've read the whole thing, but you've told me that you've read uh, many key sections of it. Jessica, what do you see in that that people should really be looking out for? Sure, so I think that really there are three things that are really going to affect individuals. One would be the reduction in the individual income tax rate from 39.6% down to 37% with the possibility of going as low as 29.6% for owners of pass-through entities who are able to take advantage of the 20% deduction for uh, pass-through income. The other, um, as we've just alluded to, is the elimination or substantial modification of a number of itemized deductions coupled with the doubling of the standard deduction. Uh, and finally would be the increase in the lifetime exemption for gift and estate taxes, which really has turned estate planning on its head. Sean Siebold, in, uh, aside from the standard deduction, are there other aspects or, or changes that people need to be aware of as they approach their taxes this year? Well, one of the most important things is the way people uh, donate to charity. In the past, these used to be things that they used to itemize. Okay, so with the increase of the standard deduction, those that used to say, I'm going to contribute $100 here or $200 there, well, that standard deduction has increased so much that may not have a beneficial tax impact. So the way that you look at taxes um, or the way that you look at charitable donations might have to change. You might have to talk to your advisor about a different mechanism with which to make these charitable deductions. So give me your overall view of this new tax code and this new tax law because it was presented and, and sold as a uh, reducing taxes on the average American. Is it doing that? Are you seeing that? Um, it depends. Um, as with anything in accounting and finance, we start with it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on where you were in the tax burden. It depends on where you live and what state. Um, some so give of me some for instances here in Illinois. Well, Illinois has a high income, has a, is a high income tax state. It has high property taxes relative to the rest of the country. As a result, um, the SALT deduction, the state and local income tax deduction, is capped at $10,000. So if you look at somebody who is paying $14,000 in property taxes, they're not going to get $4,000 deductions that they used to get. So that could make their taxes worse. However, on the other end, the, as Jessica mentioned, the property, the um, uh, rates have declined. So for some people um, in different tax brackets, their actual tax rate will go down. Mm -hmm. Jessica Spear, are fewer people going to be able to use the, the short form this coming year? You know, I think that they could, um, it, particularly if they don't have business interests. Uh, in fact, the Tax Foundation estimates that at roughly 90% of Americans are going to claim the increased standard deduction on their 2018 return, uh, which again would suggest that they would be able to use a simpler form. Um, kind of tagging on to your, the question before regarding, uh, you know, lower taxes, uh, the General Accounting Office actually estimates that roughly 30 million Americans could see a tax bill this tax filing season. Um, you know, if you do find yourself in that situation where you are owing tax, uh, one thing that we would recommend doing is considering additional withholding on salary and bonuses. Uh, simply increasing your fourth quarter estimated tax payment, for instance, could still expose you to penalties for the underpayment of estimated taxes, whereas withholding is treated as having been made ratably throughout the year, which can save penalties. Sean Siebel, give us some advice about uh, uh, increases in health care expenses and how that should be treated on this, under this new tax law. Well, the, the one item in the, in the tax bill that, that um, people have to be aware of is if you have a large year of medical expenses, um, you, get, you still get to deduct that if it's over 7.5% of your AGI. For some, that's going to be a very large leap. For some, it can be a very big number, and it should be something that they look at. So again, they should be looking at that relative to their overall standard deduction, the increased standard deduction, to make sure that they can access that if they need to.
Okay, and as I mentioned, your, your company has issued some year-end uh, tax tips, and there are some things that maybe people should do before December 31st. Give us a, a couple of the tips. Yeah, one of the things that we would recommend is that as individuals are looking at their charitable donations, consider bundling those. And what we mean by that is uh, making a large contribution in 2018 to, for example, a private foundation or uh, a donor advised fund that could make charitable grants over time. Uh, by doing that, uh, taxpayers can secure a deduction now uh, for grants that would be made over time that otherwise may not give rise to a charitable deduction. So you have to do that within the next three, week and three weeks. And Sean Siebold, give us a, a key tax tip that we can use. A key te well, there's a, there is a deadline coming up. Um, <laughs> there, there is a deadline for those that are getting divorced. So this tax law will have a, an impact. At the end of this year, you will not be able to deduct the, the uh, pay alimony payments as deductible. So that could have a very big impact. So I'm not suggesting you need to do this, but if you're in the process, <laughs> if you're considering it, <laughs> do you it have a deadline. Do it in the next three weeks and Absolutely. Happy New Year. <laughs> Jessica Spear and Sean Siebel, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank we you. appreciate it. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And join us tomorrow night live at 7. We'll have reaction and analysis to Mayor Emanuel's proposal to fix the city's pension crisis. And a new probe that landed on Mars is already revealing fresh insights into the red planet. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Aruza. Thank you for watching and good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.